This is Leah Terachansky with The Real News in Ottawa, Canada. On Friday, January 21st, the Canadian government decided to deport Mohamed Harkat. January ended with devastating news for the Harkat family. After years of imprisonment followed by the harshest bail conditions in Canada's history and an eight-year legal battle that led all the way up to the Supreme Court, Mohamed Harkat was ruled inadmissible in Canada and ordered to be removed. His case is one of three high-profile security certificates cases in Canada, and on Friday, January 21st, the federal court decided to deport him to Algeria, where he says he could be tortured. In between interviews speaking about their fight, I caught up with Mohamed and his wife Sophie at the CBC building in Ottawa. The, the initial arrest happened in 2002, we're now in 2011, and you haven't been charged with anything yet. Uh, yes, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I never charged me, or never had charged in Canada or outside Canada, and never been on. Uh, uh, charge anywhere in the world. Charge any, anywhere in the world. If you're a Canadian citizen and you're suspected of terrorism-related charges, like the famous case of the Toronto 18, you'll be arrested, charged. The evidence against you will be disclosed in a criminal court, and you'll be prosecuted. But if you're not a citizen, if you're a permanent resident or a refugee, then you get issued a security certificate and you will probably be deported. Security certificates are a controversial immigration tool because when they're issued, the person can be imprisoned indefinitely without charge. The evidence against them is kept secret and if they're a refugee rather than a permanent resident, there's a greater risk they'll be deported. When Harkat was finally released in 2006 after four years of imprisonment, including in the special wing of the Milhaven Penitentiary known as Guantanamo North, he was placed under the toughest bail conditions in Canada's history. The, the phone is stopped. Uh, the, mall, the, mall is, sorry, the mail is intercepted. Yeah, the, mail, the mail intercepted. Uh, there is a camera in the house. Uh, we can't go without the CBSA approval for four hours outing. CBSA follow us for the outing. We were only allowed three outings a week for four hours. And every outing we had two to six CBS officers with bulletproof vests and weapons following us around. Every individual entering our residence had to be pre-approved in advance, including our newborn nephew and my 80-year-old grandmother. Uh, we couldn't speak to anybody that wasn't pre-approved. No cell phones are allowed in the house. The computer is under lock. My husband cannot access to any computer or have access to internet. Um, we cannot leave Ottawa without permission. Um, he could not access a boat, a vessel, a train station, an airport. He doesn't have any travel documents. Um, he has a large sum of money over his head as surety. He has over $150,000 in surety money plus $35,000 in an account um, for the Crown. What in the GPS? Yes, and the two surveillance cameras, there was one in the hallway and one in the uh, living room as well. That mole could never be left alone for a 24-hour period. He would have to be washed inside or outside the residence. So we had a curfew on the property, and when he went to the backyard, he had to be supervised by one of the three court uh, surety appointed by the court. When he was inside the residence, he had to be uh, also supervised. For example, when he went to a public washroom, he couldn't go by himself because he could never be left alone or a change room or a doctor's appointment. Um, he could never be left alone, so one of us always had to accompany him, even including a public washroom. But if I understand correctly, you haven't actually seen any of the evidence? No, all we've been given is a report of allegation, which says we assume we believe that in the past, present, or future, he may be involved in acts of terrorism. We, we haven't given any evidence whatsoever. The certificates were previously used against Nazi sympathizers and alleged spies. But since 9-11, they've been used against Muslim or Arab men alleged to have links to terrorist groups. In 2007, after years of legal struggle, the Harkat case, along with other security certificates cases, took the legality of the system to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court unanimously voted 9-0 that the security certificate system was unconstitutional. The decision had little effect on any of the ongoing cases, but led to the law being amended. Now the accused person's lawyer reviews a selective summary of the evidence against their client. The court didn't really outline exactly what they said was constitutionally required. They just said that what pre-existed this system was not constitutional. So, you know, the special advocates have been in place and more information has been provided to the main person as a result of that decision. The question is whether or not what we have now and the manner in which Mr. Harkat's case played out, whether or not that in fact does meet constitutional requirements. 
in our position with the greatest respect is that it still doesn't. The court in, in Mr. Harkat's case did, to some extent, summarize materials in CSIS's files and, and make them available. Uh, but on numerous parts of the case, uh, did make findings of fact against Mr. Hartcat in areas where no evidence was disclosed. So that's still one of our complaints about the process is on numerous issues that formed part of the allegations. No evidence was disclosed. Nevertheless, adverse findings were made against Mr. Hartcat on those issues. CSIS and the Canadian Border Service Agency declined to give an interview on the issue, but the Ministry of Public Safety issued the following statement. The Government of Canada issues a certificate only in exceptional circumstances where the information to determine the case cannot be disclosed without endangering the safety of any person or national security. The federal court ordered CSIS to release some of the information, but the agency claimed it had destroyed the evidence. Uh, the reputation of the administration of justice had been damaged by virtue of this conduct on the part of CSIS. Uh, as a result, numerous hearings took place in secret where CSIS people were called to testify and explain themselves to the court. You know, we had hoped at the end of the day that that would, in some respect or another, adhere to Mr. Hartnett's benefit, but at the end of the day, the court found that it was satisfied with their explanations for what they had done and nevertheless did rely on, on human source information. And given all of the circumstances and given that there were proceedings taking place in secret, that at a minimum those, these special advocates should have been given an opportunity to cross-examine these people, as would be the case in a criminal trial, that these informants should have been brought into court in camera and cross-examined by Mr. Hartnett's special advocates, but that didn't happen. And we know that if we had the original material and all that, it might have changed the outcome of the case. So that's, the, that's one of the problems um, that we've, where we've come across in our cases that all original material has been destroyed. There's also been four other things which have affected the, uh, the processes that CSIS is known to use, information that comes from or derives from torture. They raided our home um, in May of um, last year, uh, two weeks short of a hearing that was scheduled to start on the reasonableness. At the same time, the, the informant itself, he uh, failed a lie detective and they never give it to the judge. Uh, mm -hmm. What uh, happened was when the CSIS failed to lie, they failed to tell the first judge, they also failed to tell the second judge that the informant had failed the lie detector test. That was discovered through a process. And the last thing they did was uh, CSIS and CBSA listened to solicitor client calls, which of course are prohibited until they were caught by the, um, the federal court. CSIS alleged that Mohammed Harkat may have worked with an Al-Qaeda operative named Ibn Khattab in Pakistan and may have traveled to Afghanistan for terrorist-related activities, something Harkat denies. In another security certificates case, federal judge Richard Mosley ruled that Ibn Khattab, who was linked to Chechen rebels, may have received funds from bin Laden, but had not been quoted as calling for jihad between Islam and the West, his struggle was against Russia and its occupation of Muslim lands. Ibn Khattab was assassinated in 2002 in a killing widely attributed to the Russian spy agency FSB. The federal judge in the Harkat case, Simon Noel, contradicted this ruling. He did not reveal any link between Harkat and Ibn Khattab, nor any other suspect, but in declassified footnotes noted that there is a lot of information on Khattab and his link to Osama bin Laden. So was Mohammed Harkat or the other cases linked to potential terrorist operatives, or was he wrongly accused and thrown into a deportation system with little transparency or accountability? Because neither Canada's intelligence or border security agencies nor the Ministry of Public Safety agreed to an interview, the real news couldn't pose these questions to them. And with the original evidence undisclosed or allegedly destroyed by CSIS itself, it's currently impossible to determine. But the way this process is going now, it's very likely Harkat will be deported to Algeria, where expert witnesses claim he may be tortured, imprisoned, or killed. Our position is that if in fact they're going to take place outside of the criminal law, that all of the Section 7 rights that are part and parcel of a fair trial need to be incorporated into the immigration process.
Okay, is there any way to appeal the judge's decision that the certificate is reasonable? Well, we are in the midst now of launching an appeal. The appeal is not so much centered on the reasonableness conclusion, but it is centered on the constitutionality or fairness of the proceeding. Legal experts, experts that testified, they were shocked by the outcome of the decision. Shocked we were all, it's like we all got a big punch in the gut, a slap in the face. It was very, very difficult to take. And we've been devastated since then. And this just adds on to the devastation that we've been living. And the deportation Mo's been facing since 2002, it's been a cloud over our head for the past eight years. It just makes it look very serious now because we have... If we don't get an appeal, we don't have any other outcomes right now. None of the accused remain at the Melhaven Penitentiary Wing, known as Guantanamo North. For The Real News, this is Leah Terichansky in Ottawa.